Testing, testing. One, two, three. Testing, testing, testing. Saturday, November 21st, we work day. We will have that. Um, we are trying to remodel the bathroom in the uh, parsonage and some other things to get done over there. Uh, and I'm just going to work on it on work days, so however long it takes. So it's our, that will be our project Saturday. Uh, family day this month is the 22nd. I guess that's next Sunday already, correct? Wow. Um, so keep that in mind. You know the schedule for that. On the 25th, that's the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, no Bible study. Uh, December the 6th, remember that's our DVD Sunday. We start early at 9.45, I think. Uh, I'm not sure how many of those we got left. On Wednesday night, we have, we have two more lessons, and we'll be done with that series. Um, our Christmas program this year will be on the 13th. 
uh, family day the 27th in December, and I'm sure the we may have a couple of Wednesday nights that we'll be canceling, but we'll let you know and get a little closer. All right, I, I have bad news and good news for you, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share this in the next service maybe a little bit more in detail. Bad news, for, for whatever reason, and, and I don't have, you know, we can blame it on COVID because everybody's blaming everything on COVID. But I went back and looked at the, the financial situation again because I, I, no, I would be doing this anyway because next month I'll be working on the budget. So it's not anything unusual. Up through the end of September, we were meeting our budget. Our budget's $2,300 a week. October crashed. And again, I don't know why. I, I, I just, you know, trying to figure things out. I, with my little bitty brain, I can't do it. But we, we dropped um, to, uh, uh, and I'm just giving you approximate number, 2,300 a week is what we need. Down, we dropped down to about 1,850 average. So that's uh, 400, and the exact number is $462 a week. That is not sustainable. You know, we can absorb a little bit of shortfall in our budget, but not that much, okay? So last week we talked about one of the things that we're going to do is murder the mortgage, all right? And uh, along that line, I have good news for you. There, there was a tremendous offering last week for that. Um, in fact, with the, what that, the gift that came in and another, I think another smaller gift and the regular uh, payment that we sent in, we took $12,155 off the mortgage. So the, the balance was $29,559.81, uh, and now we are at a balance of, and again, this is approximate because they couldn't give me an exact number until they processed everything, but it's approximately $17,404.81. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, we're, we've already knocked him down, okay, and we're going to finish him off, Lord willing. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay, seventeen thousand five hundred thirty. Again, I, I, it was an estimate, so I'll, I'll, I'll write that down for the next group. Seventeen thousand five thirty and five cents. I, I would say no cents. Um, so uh, I mean, you, if. You, you guys are smart enough to do the math. Uh, if we took the if we take the the uh, mortgage payment out, we're going to save about two hundred fifty dollars a week. So if we're still running four hundred fifty dollars a week, that's still two hundred dollars we got to make up. And I, I just want to say this real quick because you know uh, I hate talking about this anyway. But the options that we're going to have is either in whatever way the giving comes back up. And I, I, I just really don't want to harp on the people that are already giving. Um, it, apparently, somebody's quit, all right, or a few people have quit. So, you know, if you, if you have not stopped giving either, you know, I, what I'm afraid of is because of um, people staying home and watching the stream. They're doing what a friend of mine used to call storehouse tithing. They don't come to church, so they store the tithe at the house, Okay. And that's a killer on us, folks, because, you know, we got bills. Uh, we're still making a mortgage payment. We have, we have uh, uh, utilities that are, if you can imagine, all these buildings with maintenance needs. So just pray about it, especially pray about uh, God's got what we need. And if you can, help. If you're not helping and you can, please do. Um, the other option, if the giving doesn't increase, then we have two distasteful options. And I don't, I don't really want to do this, but I'm going to do what I have to do. The, one of them is we're going to sell our house and move back in the parsonage, which I really don't want to do, but again, we'll do what we have to. Um, the other one is I, I have to go back and drive in the bus, and I really don't want to do that. <laughs> All right, so just pray about that. You know, the I, I think it was the CF founder who... who um, can't remember his name right now, but said, you know, when there's a financial need, tell the people and tell God. So that's what I'm, I'm telling you guys where we're at, and we tell the Lord in prayer, and hopefully he'll, he'll help us there. Well, I know he will. All right, I'm done. Let's sing.
Thank you. Thank you this morning that we can sing the truths of that song, Redeem. And Lord, uh, we know that it's not because of anything that we have done, but Lord, by your grace and your mercy. And so we rejoice, Lord, in you. We rejoice in all that you have done for our sakes. And Lord, the reality is now we owe a debt of love. Uh, one that we can never repay, but Lord, ought, that we ought to strive, Lord, to, to give our lives as you exhort us to do a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. Now, Lord, help us this morning. We, Lord, cannot overstate the importance of your word. And Lord, as we open it this morning, open our ears, our minds, our hearts to receive it. Lord, not in the sense that we sometimes do and say, yeah, that's my doctrinal statement. But Lord, receive it in the sense of applying it to our lives and fleshing it out. And Lord, we'll thank you for the fruits of it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. How many of you are, are bummed out? Uh, I mean, we might as well admit it. it, it it's hard to stay uh, positive in a negative world. Amen? It's hard to have a sound mind in a crazy world, and it seems like a world that's getting more crazy minute by minute. But I, I would remind you again, and, and the, again, the, I can only say this because God's helping me. I, it's not, I mean, I am by nature, some of you know, sometimes I whine a lot. Don't say amen, Morse. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, I have to fight against that. I, I, I want God's joy and God's peace and God's contentment not only control my heart, but I want, I want to exude that. I want, I want to show that. The reality is Christians of all people have a reason to be happy and joy-filled and content. Even, even when things are crazy around us. 
And, and they are. We have to admit that. So we've been looking at, you know, again, a sound mind, a crazy world, and dealing with depression, and I get it. There, there is clinical depression. There is actual organic cause. By organic, I mean physical things. In fact, you know, you know this. If, if you're sick, uh, sometimes you are down, right? So physical things can cause depression. But I have to say this, most of the time, in the case of believers, that's not the reason, okay? And the reason's what James McDonald called our stinking thinking, all right? We don't, we don't, we don't process things right, okay? So we've been looking at that, and we've been, in particular, we've been looking at how we defeat depression, and really, again, I have to kind of correct myself, because we're not defeating anything, but how we allow God to defeat depression in our lives. And it begins, first of all, with a God focus. We're going to do a little quick review. By the way, I don't do these reviews for your sake so much as I do mine, because I forget where I'm at. No. Uh, we begin with a God focus. We, we, we will never have what God wants us to have till we settle the matter that God matters most. And that's what we mean by God focus. It's not about that's not about me. It's not about my happiness. It's not about God is not my self help guru, and His word's not a self help manual. Uh, it's all about Him. And until we get to that point, we're going to struggle in life as believers, because God didn't design it any other way. He wants us to glorify Him. Amen. All right, so we start with a God focus. Secondly, we have the right expectations in life. Jesus said, uh, in the world, ye once in a while might, could be, have tribulation. No, he said, it, you shall have tribulation. We, we know that by the word and by experience. But he goes on to say, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. So he's telling us where the secret for... Um, a, a right outlook on life. It's him. So have the right expectation. There's going to be trouble in life. There's going to be people elected that we don't really want elected. Okay? Uh, there's going to be things done by people that we don't like. That's just the reality. We're going to have sickness. We're going to have car trouble. Uh, appliances are going to break. Um, I, I went to lay down my Bible and some other paperwork on the fireplace hearth, which is brick, this morning, and I didn't think I laid it down that hard, but I laid it down hard enough to smash my finger. I, I whined to Joan a little bit, you know. But guess what? Christians do stuff like that too, okay? So have the right expect, expectation. Thirdly, you must discipline your thought life. I'm not going to labor that. Just look at Philippians 4, 8. God gives the parameters for our thought life, that, and that verse strongly implies that we can control our thought life. Amen? All right. And then fourthly, you must study the Word of God so that you know the God of the Word. Um, we, we, I, I cannot overstate the importance of the Bible and studying it, memorizing it, singing about it, uh, making it part of our lives and spending more time in it than we do the television and Facebook and et cetera. Three people, all right. All right, then we started looking at some practical things that we need to do, all right? And the one that, we only got through one last week, and that is do what you're supposed to do no matter how you feel, all right? And we looked at Genesis chapter 4, 1 through 7. I will read that again this morning because we're going to continue some thoughts out of that. And Adam knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain and said... I have gotten a man from the Lord, and she again bare his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering to the Lord. And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. He got the poochie lip. 
Yeah, he got depressed. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance falling? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. In other words, the Lord's saying, if you, if you do the right thing, your countenance is going to be lifted. If you do the right thing, you're going to feel better. You're, but you start with doing the right thing. You don't start with how I feel. You don't wait till you feel like doing the right thing. We, we went to an excellent conference, a small church conference this week. It was excellent. I'm going to be honest with you. I didn't feel like going. I, I, I did not feel like going at all. Uh, and there was several factors there. But I am so glad that I went. I'm so glad that I acted against the way I felt and went. And that's what we have to do. If you wait till you feel like you're reading the Bible, you will not read the Bible. If you wait till you feel like praying, you're not going to pray. If you wait till you feel like going to church, chances are you're not going to go to church. If you wait till you feel like witnessing, you probably won't witness. We act against our feelings, and we do it all the time. Not many people feel like going to work, but responsible people get up and go to work anyway. All right? So we, we act against our feelings. And if we do what's right, then a lot of times we'll feel better. Uh, and some of these first ones are, are going to be related. For example, the next one, the next one. Uh, I, I had to learn this again here recently. Praise God and give thanks in all things. How many of you, you, you know that? Okay. I mean, the Bible teaches it. We know it. We know it. Amen? How many of you did that after Biden was elected? Well, there might be some of you in here who are really glad he got elected, but and that's all I'm going to say about that. I, you know, I, 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 come, I came back in here Sunday. I told you the first thing I, after the election, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. Jesus Christ is still, still the sovereign Lord of the universe, and he's still in absolute 100% control. And the Bible teaches he puts people in that he wants and takes them out. So praise God that Joe Biden got elected. Some of you are not saying it. Shame on you. Well, I, it's what God wants because he's con, in control of this thing. In fact, I mean, if we think about it, there could be a lot of good come out, but that, that's for another time. Oh, well, yeah. God's not down All right, well, whatever. I'm just assuming. They're coming after me. The Trumpsters are after me now. Your car breaks down. You praise God and give thanks for that? Well, I, I admit, and now I admit, you know, that and we had this on uh, uh, our, one of our Wednesday night lessons. We have to talk to ourselves. I, I admit that. So initially, we, we may not get this right. But eventually we should get it right. When, when the Bible says, for example, in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, you, you explain this away if you can. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now explain that away for me. In everything. I'm pretty slow, okay? I admit it. I, I, 
I'm not the brightest bulb in the house. But I can understand that. Everything means everything. It means everything. We sing about it. I hope we don't sing it hypocritically, but we sing. When upon life's billows you are tempest-tossed, when you are discouraged thinking all is lost, count your many blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. You know the song. Count your blessings. The psalmist wrote, Psalm 69, 30, I will praise the name of God with a song and will magnify him with thanksgiving. And it does not say when everything is going the way I want it to go. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. You know this one. We deal with it almost every Thanksgiving day. And into his courts with praise and be thankful unto him and bless his name. Psalm 147, 7, sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving and sing praise upon the harp unto our God. I, you know, in a, in a minute, one of the points that we're going to look at about how to lift yourself out of a depressed state or a down or discouraged state is listen, listen to godly, uplifting Christian music. Because of this very thing. Steve Lair said the third step in the prescription is essential for getting rid of de depression. Take part in the therapy of thanks. I like the way that he put that. Take part in the therapy of thanks. Now you say, how, how can we do this? Folks, you've got to know God. You've got to know God. Again, we're coming back to the Bible. God is sovereign. God is sovereign. You put your put a filter in front of your face, an imaginary filter. This is a hand, not a filter. Okay, put an imaginary filter in front of your face. There is nothing that comes through that filter that can get to you. That filter is God's sovereignty. See, we we don't have a problem acknowledging God's sovereignty and history and the way that he's done things. And maybe we don't even have trouble acknowledging God's sovereignty, you know, over the control of the events going on out there. But listen, folks, he is also sovereign over the events of your life. He's sovereign over what happens to you. If, if that's not so, he's not much of a God. If he's not in control of what comes into my, my life, then he's not much of a God. What we can deduce from this is, and this is very uh, counterculture, the Christian is never a victim. Never. We, we can't say we're a victim of our circumstance, or we're a victim of a bad economy, or we're a victim of other people's mistreatment. Because though we might not be in control, he is always in control. And, and so I, here's the verse you've got to hang on to. I, again, I had to relearn this recently. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose. All things. He said, I don't see how blah, blah, blah can be good. That's because, Tim, you're duff, dumber than a buffalo. <laughs> That's an inside joke there. He's not really dumber than a buffalo. But. <laughs> we, we all, we all are not. Well, you know, when it comes to God, we're all stupid. We can't, we can't figure it all out. We, we don't have that capacity. We don't have the capacity to understand how he's working. It's just not there, folks. So we have to trust that he is. And because he is, 
We can obey that command to give thanks in all things. And when you are down and discouraged about things that are happening around you or in you, practice the therapy of thanks. We, again, it's, it's a matter of acting against how we feel. We may not feel like giving thanks. But do it anyway. Amen? We may have to do it like a sheepish little child. Lord, I don't get this. I don't understand. I, why, I don't understand why you're doing this. But I believe you're sovereign, and I thank you for what you're doing. I... I, I I'm not perfected this, folks. I had to, I've confessed it's easier said than done, but you can do it. You can do. I, we can, in fact, you can do anything that God commands you to because he'll, he'll give you, if you supply the initiative, he'll supply the enabling grace. Okay? All right, number three. Serve other people. I, you know, one of the things, that I, and I don't remember what workshop we were in, but I, I was thinking about this. You know what the biggest problem we have is? It's not the political thing. It's not our spouse. It's not the condition, not the weather today. The biggest problem that we have is sin, and the root of sin is our selfishness. Depression is by nature a self-focus. Me and my problems. <laughs> Shouldn't have done that. <laughs> so, if that's true, and it is, then one part of the cure, the cure is to get our mind off of ourselves and on others. And, and I've counseled people with this in this way. They don't often take the counsel, but, you know, if, you're, if you are down and discouraged and depressed, then get off your duff, go find somebody you can help. I, I, volunteer in a hospital, visit somebody that's sick, do something for somebody else. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. And that's just two different forms of selfish and self-promotion. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Now listen carefully, verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I, I've talked about this a lot of times when people visit churches. The mindset you ought to have when you come to a church is not, what are you, what are you people going to do for me? You know, how are you going to make me feel good? What are you going to provide? What services do you, do you have? The mindset ought to be, first and foremost, is God, do you want me here? And then secondly is, how can I serve here? How can I be a blessing to these people and to others by being a part of this church? If the root of the problem is self-centeredness, and it is, then the answer is obvious. We have to take interest in other people and what they're struggling with. Now, again, it's got to be a genuine interest. One of the problems that we've, we've struggled with is um, and we have to check our motives. We don't go help people just to get, get them in and grow our church. I think that, that might be a byproduct, but you, you go just for the sake of helping them, period, whether it benefits us or not. That's, that's why I always, uh, I've always thought that it's good. You know, I'm, I started uh, ministry in a nursing home. I, I, I had a little circuit. I preached in four nursing homes. And I, 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 said, I jokingly said that was good for me because it got me prepared for the pastorate because after five minutes preaching in a nursing home, they all go to sleep. <laughs> the other benefit is 
When we went to nursing home, we didn't take offerings. Those people weren't going to get out of their wheelchairs and come to our church and do something. It was ministering to people who could give you nothing back. We, folks, we need that. We need that. We don't, we don't bless people to get blessed. We just bless people. So we have to have a genuine interest and, and not, not trying to manipulate them or gain their approval. And that's why Paul said, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. That's the, that's the matter of motives. Um, Hebrews 12, 11 through 14. Now, no chastening for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. I always used to tell the kids in the school that verse after I whooped them. <laughs> no chastening for the present seems to be joyous but grievous. Nevertheless, after it yield the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby, wherefore lift up the hands which hang down and feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men, holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. I'm going to tell you something. No matter how bad you've got it, somebody else out there has got it worse. Let's see if we can find them and help them. Amen? To lead happy Christian life is to be loving, actively outgoing towards others as a service to God. Uh, let's, let's leave it at that. This next one's related to that, number four. And again, these are practical things, but I think they're also biblical. Stay busy. Stay busy. Uh, you've all heard the saying that idle hands are the devil's workshop. There's a lot of truth to that on a lot of levels, including, I think, our, our mental state. Uh, Paul wrote 1 Timothy 5, 13, and with all they learn to be idle, wandering about this in a negative, from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers and busybodies speaking things which they ought not. Then in 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12, he wrote, for even when we were with you, this we command you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some that walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but busybodies, now, them that are such we command and exhort by the Lord Jesus Christ that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. Proverbs 20, 14, 23, I like this one. In all labor there is profit, but the talk of the lips tendeth only to funerary. I, I respect hardworking people. I really do. I think sometimes we get out of balance and work too much, but God doesn't, you know, there. This is off track just a little bit, but you know what is one problem with this, with the streaming of our services is that people who lack motivation, they just stay home and watch. And you know, I'm thinking that, that's a bad thing. But you know, it, we, it's just an extension that what happens in churches sometimes. People just come in and sit down and watch what's going on and they get up and leave. They, they don't minister grace. They don't minister grace to each other or to people outside. So Christianity for them is just a spectator thing. It, it is not, folks. That, I think that that's why that, that transition from just staying at home and watching on the recliner from coming, it's so easy for some people because it's not different. I, you know, I don't know about you, but I want uh, to be here because I love you guys. And I don't know if I'm an encouragement, but I'd like to be an encouragement to you. Okay? For some of you, it might be a discouragement, but one thing about it, we, this was brought out in, yesterday in the, in the uh, conference. There are, there are 21 one, one another commands in Scripture. 21 one another. You can't do that unless you are in contact with people. Amen? I, I'm going to even go farther. This COVID thing is bad because we even need the human touch. We need the handshakes. We need the hugs. We need that. That's part of 
expressed it, love and concern for each other. Now, I know some of you don't like hugs. That's okay. I'm not going to name any names, Morse. <laughs> huh? Amen. All right. So if you start feeling down, just get up, go, and do something productive. In fact, there, there is worth, as far as how you feel, in accomplishment. Just getting something done. How many of you, uh, housewives, you get the house cleaned up, you feel good? <laughs> you guys get the lawn all mowed and the weed eater ran and stuff, and, and you sit down in the chair and you look at it and you feel good because you got something done. Amen? Amen? Accomplishment will lift your spirit. Okay? That's why some people, they get after me about mowing or, or painting or doing something around church. I said, you know, take it easy here. Because ministry is hard to measure where you've been. When I mow, I can look back and tell where I've been. I have a sense of accomplishment. When I paint a wall, I can tell where I've been. Uh, not so much when I preach in council. <laughs> it's hard to tell where you've been. All right, so get up, do something. All right, number, I'm going to hit these last two pretty quick. Number five, listen to and sing godly music. You know what will depress you? Country western music. I'm serious. What do they sing about? The dog died and she's gone and they say if you play the record backward that uh, he gets his dog back and his wife back and uh, his job back and everything's wonderful. <laughs> and I get it. There's some secular music that is upbeat. It's hard to listen to some bluegrass music that doesn't lift your spirits. A lot of bluegrass has a Christian theme. Uh, I don't know about you, but I like all kinds of music. Um, I like a, I like a Cajun music with the Morse would hate this, but with the squeeze box and stuff. It's just it's just a joyful music. Uh, polka music is is uplifting music, but none of that is as good as lif, listening to edifying, godly Christian music, especially when you're down in the mully grubs. Okay. Um, good godly Christian music will lift you. In fact, we're instructed. Ephesians 5.19 says, Speaking yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. That, that verse has joy written all over it. Amen? Uh, Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and, and admonishing one another. How? In psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Uh, Hebrews 2.12, saying, I will declare thy name to my brethren in the midst of the church. I will I sing praise to thee. James 5.13, is there any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Singing. So if you're like me, you can't really sing that well, or at least you don't want to listen to yourself. You can whistle, hum. You know, whatever you do, that put, that something puts you in mind of, I, one of the things that I love about hymns is that they're pregnant with spiritual truth, okay? The, and some contemporary music is too. A lot of it's not, you know, you know what I'm talking about, the 7-Eleven song. Take seven words, sing them 11 times. Makes me want to put my head through the wall. But, but you need music that has a message and that the message is uplifting, okay? And, and it's okay if it has an up-tempo, too. That doesn't hurt anything. What, what, happened, what happened when Saul got depressed? He would call for who? David to play. Music ha has, in fact, that's what we have to be careful about music because it is such a powerful motive. You can manipulate people with music. 
You, you can do that. I mean, rock concert, proof of that. You can manipulate people. So you've got to be careful, but godly, Christian-themed, upbeat music will pick you up in a heartbeat. I guarantee it. Amen? I, we, we, our choir songs, a lot of times I, I have those on my head through the week. I, there's one that, that we're singing now. Uh, I want a simple kind of Christian, uh, not Christian, Christmas this year. Uh, that's, a, that's a, I love that song, it's, and it's uplifting, amen? Anyway, last point, hang around the right people. You've heard the saying, misery loves company. Sad, you know, sad, depressive people, they like to hang around with other sad, depressive people. That's true. Uh, so if you want to be joy-filled, hang around joy-filled people. People that, that aren't always harping on, you know, everything is wrong, woe is me, um, Igor, Igor mindset. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, be not deceived. Evil communication corrupts good manners. Uh, who you hang around with will affect you. Uh, the the uh, authorized version says, do not deceive evil company corrupts good habits. Um, brethren, if a man be overtaken at fault, Galatians 6 Ye which are spiritual, and that just means the one controlled by the Spirit. You want to be around spiritual people. People are being controlled by the Holy Spirit. Not their flesh, not the, not the world, but they're being controlled by the Spirit. Birds of a feather flock together. Depressed people tend to gather with other depressed people because they understand. That's what support groups are a lot of times. Mutual gripe sessions. Um... Hang around those who have the answer, the faithful, faith-filled. I'm going to throw this last one in, exercise. I, I understand that if you exercise, it will help you with depression, okay? Well, since I'm not depressed, I don't exercise, so I really wouldn't know about it. But, but uh, they claim that there's one physical thing that can be done to have more of an effect in helping you with depression than anything else, and that's that's. It, exerting exercise, all right? If you, you test that out, let me know how it goes, all right? All right, Lord, we love you so much. And we're so grateful that, Lord, you have the answers for, for the things that we struggle with. And, Lord, the bottom line, out of all that we've said in, in dealing with this, these practical things, is, Lord, it's just a matter of putting you first in our lives and, and allowing ourselves to be filled with you. And... Lord, that goes a long, long way, helping us to be joy-filled, hope-filled, content people. And Lord, that's what we want, because we don't want to invite people to come to Christ and, and be like we've been sucking on sour pickle. Nobody wants it. Lord, we want to exhibit that uh, joy-filled, positive life, because Lord, we do believe, um, as Hebrews 11 once says, that you are and that you're a rewarder of those that diligently seek you. Now, Lord, help us now. The remainder of time we spend together, bless the next service. Speak to us from your word, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, you are dismissed.